Amen. We thank God for those words and for the worship, things that have gone forth. And we thank God for his word uh, that he's about to bring for us. We uh, started on a series, um, Woe to the Shepherds. And we are saying shepherds because the word of God referred to the shepherds. But it's talking about anyone that God uses or anyone that, that, is, that stands before God's people, whether you're a shepherd where you, whether you are a pastor or um, whatever you may be for the Lord um, um, we have to be we have to make sure that we are lined up with God's word when it comes to these things that uh, God has for us and so this is a warning to the shepherds to those who uh, are in place and not, not only to the false shepherds and the, or the wolves in sheep's clothing, but this is also a warning to um, the true shepherds. Because just because God has put you in a place that doesn't stop the devil from tempting you. And so we want to make sure that, that people are warned of the shepherds, the prophets, apostles, whoever you may be. This is a warning to you concerning God's word and how the enemy may try to come. And, uh, and, and if you've noticed, if you've listened to the last few parts of this series, you've noticed that the generic theme have been about money and going after power and money. And these are the things that the devil uh, tempts people with, you know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these three things. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to fall for the tricks and the snares of the enemy. And uh, one way we can do that is to constantly be reminded of how others have failed. We see all through the Word of God, uh, great men of God falling behind several things. And these things are written for us so that we don't fall for the same traps. The devil, um, he uses the same bait over and over again to get people. And so we have to be careful that we recognize the enemy and that we, and that we don't allow ourselves to be taken captive by by what he uh, by what he is baiting us with and so let's be prayerful for one another that we will remain in the faith and that God will continue to have his way in our lives alright so if you have your Bibles let's go to the third chapter of the book of Micah we're going to continue in this series of woe to the shepherds the ch third chapter of the book of Micah of course Micah is right after Jonah the book of Jonah of course, Michael was a prophet of the Lord uh, um, who God used mightily and, and we, we learned several things in this book concerning what God uh, has to say to his people in general and also to his the false prophets, to the, to the wicked prophets. And God will use whoever will um, um, oblige themselves to God. God will use whoever yield themselves to him. But we have to be careful that we keep ourselves in a position to be used by God. Many times in this Christian journey, uh, people will start off good and uh, will allow themselves to be used um, by the Lord. And then God takes us to a place and sometimes we get big headed, sometimes we lose focus or whatever the case may be. And then God can't use us anymore, you know, because God won't share his glory with anyone. And uh, definitely God won't keep you in the forefront in front of his people living in sin. You know, not if he's called you. And especially, you know, so we have to be careful that we don't become the enemies of God by um, doing those things that, that are contrary to his word. Uh, Satan, before he became the devil, he was Lucifer. And he tried to uh, have his own way and his own will. And the Bible says that God did not spare the angels, those that rebelled against him, which was about a third of the angels. The Bible says that God did not spare them. And so if God did not spare them for, for their disobedience and for their rebellion. And how much more so do we think he'll spare us? God, God will not spare us. You know, the devil started off right. God didn't create him the, and make him the devil. He became what he was through his own choices. And so God can create you to be a certain way, 
but through your own choices you become something else and that is just the natural way of things if we're not careful we will become some, something that God didn't intend for us to be and what will happen is we'll think that we're still in God's good graces because God used us and before you know it we become the, God, the enemies of God the same way the devil did you see and so we get to choose God does not just because you get saved and just because God is using you that doesn't take away your free will you still have a free will you can go out sleep around you can go out and do whatever you want to do do whatever you want to do you know but so God doesn't take away that free will so what you have to do is you have to make your flesh line up into subjection now um, we, the word makes it clear that that flesh cannot be saved flesh uh, does it can't come before the Lord flesh won't enter into heaven it won't do any of those things so flesh flesh has to go back to the dust where it come from back to the earth where it come from so what becomes saved is our soul and our spirit man the inside of us where God dwells that is the part of us that becomes regenerated that spirit that's within us the real us that becomes regenerated now God took us from the earth you see, God took us from the from the dust of the earth. And when sin entered into this world, this, this dust was under contract. And so it has to go back to the to the dust. It has to go back to the earth. And so here we have in this flesh is an enemy of God. You see, this flesh will always be and always work against the Spirit of God. Always. Jesus said when he was here that the Spirit is indeed willing but the flesh is weak and he was speaking about when he told his disciples to watch with him while he prayed and to pray as well and he came back two or three times and they were all asleep and he said indeed the, the flesh the, the spirit is willing in other words we have a mind and a will to do something for the Lord and to live right but this flesh is weak see flesh doesn't get saved you see flesh will always be the enemy of God don't you think for one minute that because you get saved that God just puts you on our autopilot and all of a sudden you're just lining up with everything and just everything is going the way it's supposed to go that's not how it happens flesh does not get saved the spirit does and so this flesh always wars against the spirit and because of that we have to bring this flesh under subjection to the spirit you see you have those two natures there always those two natures as long as you are alive in your body those two natures will always be at war with one another always you have two natures you see that old Adam he hasn't gone anywhere so you do you have two natures and so we have to be careful that we feed our new nature that we don't allow this old nature and that we don't continue to feed it so that it's stronger than the new nature you see the Bible lets us know that be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he reap if you sow to the flesh in other words if you're constantly planting stuff in your flesh then you're going to of the flesh reap corruption in other words what now what, what does that mean in English as long as you cater to your flesh just in other words your appetites mm -hmm. your appetites you see uh, and you know we we have to just get real serious and we just have to just tell it like it is uh, when it comes to the Word of God I was having a conversation uh, one time with a uh, young man and he was talking about how uh, he had uh, you know did some things uh, concerning his marriage that he wasn't proud about basically uh, cheating on his his wife and uh, a, a lot of times w when people fall into that snare they think well if I can just get my flesh if I can just stop this this uh, sexual urge that I have then everything will be fine you see and so what happens is people think that way in Christianity if I can just stop these urges mm -hmm. I will be fine well, you're never going to be able to stop the devil from coming to you, tempting you. So, you going and getting castrated or whatever it is, 
that that doesn't take the urge away. That appetite for sin will, is going to be there. And so what we do is we feed this spirit man and it becomes stronger Amen. than our flesh. And we are able to bring this flesh under subjection. That's right. And so, you know, he was telling me about these different women that he had, had food with over the years, you know. And of course, he's not that way now. But he's just talking about in his past how he was. Just fooling with all these different women. Uh, even though he was married and it, it got to the point where he just felt like he couldn't help himself, you know. And so I had to let him know, and I think it was by the unction of the Holy Spirit, you know, there's not one man alive that's straight, that don't have a strong sexual desire. Mm -hmm. Not one. But what the devil does is he tries to pervert it and, and, and get it to, to fish for things that it shouldn't fish for. Mm -hmm. In other words, the prayer shouldn't be, Lord, take away the strong urge that I have. But the prayer should be, Lord, help me to direct it in the right place. Amen. In your will. Amen. You see, the devil has a perversion for everything. And so we have to be careful that that is our prayer. God doesn't want to Amen. take your, 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 your sexual desire away. That's natural. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to be under your flesh under subjection until it's time Amen. for that to come to pass. You see, when Paul was talking about in, in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians, when he talked about, um, you know, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. But he said, if you can't contain yourself, he didn't say go and pray and ask the Lord to remove that desire. That's fine. Why? Because that in itself is perverted. What did he say? He said, you get your wife, and you marry that woman, whoever that woman is that you have a desire to touch and to be with sexually, you marry her because it's better to marry than to burn. He didn't say, ask the Lord to take the desire away from you and uh, that'll fix it all. Why? Because the day will come when you get married and now your desire is gone. Mm -hmm. Or the day will come when you'll get it right and God will renew your mind and your desire towards your wife is gone. So God doesn't want to take your sexual desire away. He wants you to keep it in its proper context. And so in that discussion, I was telling him that, that God, there's nothing wrong with a strong sexual uh, desire or urge. That there's, There aren't too many men that I know of personally. I don't know of any man personally that don't have that desire and that urge. You see? But here's the thing. It should be directed towards your wife. You see, it should be directed towards your wife, and that's what God, uh, uh, you know, that's what God's desire is. Mm -hmm. He gave you that desire for your wife, and that, and let me so any any woman that may be listening in or listening to this archive, if you're married or you plan on being married, it is your job, one of your jobs, to fulfill that desire. In your husband, because in that in that same group of scriptures, we read that the husband and the wife are not to defraud one another, except it be for a season and with consent. In other words, I can't, as a husband, tell my wife uh, that I'm fasting, so uh, you know, ain't gonna be none of us coming together. We're not gonna get together, and she can't come to me and say she's fasting and praying, so you know, she's just taking a break from me for a week, for a week or so. It says with consent. Mm -hmm. Why? Because her body don't belong to her. It belongs to me. And my body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to her. And so. But we'll avoid a lot of things. If we would just stick with the word of God. You know. And I don't know why I'm on this. But some of you women. You think it's okay to play games with your body. Concerning your husband. And the, the word, in fact, let's go look at that real quick. The seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. The seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, now, these epistles that we read that Paul wrote, a lot of times he was responding to what was written to him. 
And if, from what I understand, some of the libraries have these epistles, have these letters that were written to Paul that Paul was responding to, you know. And so here he's letting them know, now, now concerning the things that you wrote to me. He said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, no doubt that question have come up, had come up to him. And it also comes today. And, and this is what I say. And, and, you know, it's just the wisdom of God. And sometimes, well, all the time, it's just best that we accept the wisdom of God. It is not good. Now, he didn't say, don't touch a woman. In other words, caress her, kiss her. But Paul said, it is not good for you to do that. Why did he say that? Because when you kissing and touching and doing those things, that stuff is going to lead to other stuff. That's why I have a problem with junior highs and high school putting on dances and allowing children to slow dance with their bodies touching one another. That's the devil. And that opens up the door for other things to take place. You see? But we say, no, you know, Brother Bolin, you old-fashioned. Are you just... No, we have to stick with the Word of God. Why do you think we have so much going on today with teen pregnancies and, and, and things like that? It's because we have opened the door for it. And even in schools today, they teaching sex education. Nothing wrong with that in itself. But I think that that should come from the home, from the parents. You see, that should come from the home. And, and today, you have schools who are passing out condoms to children. Well, you know, we don't want them. To, we know they're going to be active, so and we don't want them to, you know, get pregnant. We know they're going to be active. Ain't nothing we can do. Yeah, it's something you could do about it. Because mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer, if you're big and bad enough to go out there and have sex, you big and bad enough to suffer the consequences. That includes STDs and children, babies. If you want to go out there and sleep around, you'll reap what you sow. And, and it, it bothers me mm -hmm. that the world have come up with ways to try to outsmart God. Mm -hmm. Because they do have STDs that condoms won't fix. Right. You can still get pregnant wearing condoms. So you ain't going to out slick God. Amen. And that's the problem with this world today. We'll, we'll set up our own ways and we'll disobey God. And, and we'll find ways to get around. And we'll make our own loopholes. And God said, you just don't know. I'll cause that condom to break. And then what you going to do? You still got STDs out there that you can catch. And so here it, it teaches us that it's not good for a man to touch a woman. You see, and we have to get over that. We have to get beyond that idea of thinking, well, I, I, I can play with the devil and uh, I, I can walk down and play his game and still beat him at it. No, you're not going to beat the devil. Because when you agree to play that game, the devil have already got you whipped. That's right. You see, so this tells us it is not good for a man to touch a woman. You see. Nevertheless, verse 2, because of sexual immorality or fornication, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. In other words, Paul is saying if you want to touch somebody, you have your wife to touch. Don't touch your girlfriend, your fiance. Mm -hmm. You touch your own, the person that you're in covenant with. And if you haven't married them, then don't touch them. You, you shouldn't do that. Because those things lead to other things. Before you know it, you're in sin and you're crying out to the Lord trying to figure out how did this happen. How did it happen? You disobeyed the counsel of God. You were touching when you shouldn't have been touching. You thought that you could stop yourself and, and one thing led to another. And before you know it, you got two and three babies walking around here. God's not, you're not going to mock God. He's going to, you know, and, and all these little secret things that we think we can do behind the scenes, mm -hmm. God will expose it. He'll expose it. All right, verse 3 says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Now that's talking about 
affection. You see, that's talking about not defrauding one another. Now, it, it, in this verse, it's talking about affection. What happens uh, over the years, people have had sex with this person, that person, this person, that person, and before you know it, the desire, the sexual desire isn't as strong as it used to be. Then when you finally marry your wife or your husband, uh, you're not as hot for them as what you should be because you done gave it to everybody else. Amen. And that's what happens. You done, been, you done burnt out. And so now, of course, you, you don't have a desire. You done slept with everybody already. And now the devil done trained your mind that all men want and all women want, all men want is sex from you. Even your husband. You see, that's why we have to be careful with giving our bodies to this person, to that person. Because if, if they don't marry us and they don't have the love of God in them, we become, our, main, our mind become warped. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody do come along that actually want us, and not just want us for our money or our bodies, we don't know how to accept it. And so, it, it, and so what happens is affection goes out the door. You just get stone cold. Mm. Why? Because you've been affectionate before and got your heart broke five, six times. And now the affection is gone with whoever it was you gave your heart to. So every time you see them, you think about all the good times you had and how you wish you hadn't gave them the time of day. And, and you got a husband or a wife sitting over here who you're still not giving the time of day to. Mm -hmm. You're married to them, but you're just in contract with one another. That's it. No affection. God intends for his people to be affectionate with one another. Husband and wife should be affectionate with one another. Amen. When I see married couples that's not touching one another, that's not loving on one another, there is something wrong with that picture, and you are in trouble. That's why you young people, you young women, and you young men, you keep yourselves. And if you have given yourself already to somebody that's not married and you're currently in a relationship, you stop it and keep yourself. Because what you're doing is hurting yourself in the long run. You're ruining yourself for somebody that God has for you. And then you have to learn how to accept love all over again and all of these things. And so God intends for you, us to be affectionate towards one another. That's the husband and wife. God intends for us to be affectionate towards one another. Verse 4 says, The wife does not have power or authority over her own body. You see that? And, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority or power over his own body, but the wife does. That, so that's saying that the husband can't deny his wife and the wife can't deny her her husband. You see, and so we have to be careful that we as believers walk this word out. Now, this doesn't say that the husband has power over his own body because, you know, because his wife isn't doing what she uh, what he want her to do. And it doesn't say that the wife uh, she doesn't have power over her, over her own body except when she's not getting her way. No, nobody has power over their own body. If you are married, that power belongs to your spouse. Your body belongs to them. And that is God's desire, is that you give yourself to your spouse. That is God's desire. You see, verse 5 says, Do not defraud, or in other words, deprive one another except with consent, for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and we'll, we'll continue with that but it's, it's telling us not to defraud one another in other words I have no business as, as, as a husband uh, if my wife is wanting to be with me intimately I have no business withholding my body from her under any circumstances except it, it be with agreement you see I have no business withholding my body from her, and she has no business withholding her body from me, except with consent. Why? Because if you if 
If I don't own myself, if I don't have power over my own body, I can't deny her except she agreed to it. And if she doesn't have power over her own body, she can't deny me except I, uh, except I agree to it. Many problems in marriages today stem from people not obeying these, just these few scriptures here. You, I'm speaking as a man. Some of you women, you have no idea what you do when you call yourself with holding your body and vice versa. Men, you don't, you have no idea what you're doing when you call yourself with holding your body. You are moving into the area of witchcraft when you withhold your bodies for whatever reason except it be with consent. Why? Because what you're saying is I have, I'm disobeying the word and I have, I have power over my own body and I'm going to use it to control you. I'm not in a mood or whatever. I'm going to use it to control you. And when you try to control somebody through other means, because you're not getting your way, even attitudes and all of these things, because you're not getting your way, you are moving into witchcraft. Amen. You see? And so that's not God's desire. And, and I say the women first because most of the time it's the women that withhold their bodies. I don't know too many men that are going to just, you know, just put it off and, uh, no. Most of the time it's the women. And, and unfortunately, um, women's lives have snuck, snuck into the church and, and got women thinking that they have authority that they don't have in the home. You do not have authority to dictate your husband to, be a, to, to rule over him with your body. Amen. And, and let me tell you something. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. And you may say, well, okay, I give my body to him, but I'm going to just lay here. I'm going to just... You're still wrong. You're still wrong. And so we better stop this. I'm talking about church people. Amen. Better stop this business of... of Operating in that manner, you know, trying to control your spouse, using your body, or, or, or whatever the case may be, God is not pleased with that. And we'll read why in just a second. It says, uh, last part of that verse, it says, um, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. We're in verse 5, the last part. And it says, and come together again. Why? So that Satan does not tempt you. Because of your lack of self-control or incontinency. So that Satan does not tempt you. What happens when people think that they can withhold their bodies from their spouses? Satan comes in. He knows that. Now, first of all, he's going to talk you into doing it. Withhold your body. Yeah, just withhold your body until, until they come around. Until they finally get the point. That is your way or no way. Just, just play that game. And withhold your body. And the same devil that's telling you to withhold your body, he's going to your spouse and saying, you see she or he, they're withholding their body. You, all those women that's chasing after you in church, you, you see that look that sister so-and-so gave you in church? Mm -hmm. I bet she won't do that. The devil's playing both sides of the cards. Amen. And you too foolish to know it. The same devil that's talking you into withholding your body, it's talking your spouse into going and getting with somebody that have no problem was not withholding their bodies. Mm -hmm. You see? And so we have to, that. if you're going to play that game, you're, you're playing to lose. You're going to lose if you're playing that game. You see? It says, uh, verse 6 says, But I say this as a concession, not as commandment. In other words, by permission, not as commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot contain themselves, or in other words, exercise self-control, mm -hmm. let them pray to the Lord and ask the Lord to remove that desire from them. No, it says, let them marry. In other words, if you can't bring your body under subjection in that area, 
you marry. Why? It says, for it is better to marry than to burn. Now, uh, a lot of times, you know, I've heard two different interpretations of that. It's better to marry than to burn, and sometimes I've heard preachers say, it, it, you know, that burn re talks about burning with passion. Now, that's anybody that is, that is, that have any kind of sexual drive. You're going to have passion burning on the inside of you. That, those hormones are there. So Paul is not talking about it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Why? Because you can be married and still have passion. It just has to be directed towards your spouse. So no false prophet. He's not talking about burning with passion towards your spouse. Because it's God's desire that you burn with passion. But towards your spouse. He's not talking about, see, in this, let's look at that. It, for it's better to marry than to burn. It's, in other words, he's talking about either or. He just got finished talking about um, um, not being able to exercise self-control. Mm -hmm. So, in, in other words, he's not telling you get rid of the, not, you know, get rid of the, uh, the, the passion. He's talking about marry so that you'll have a spouse to direct that passion towards. So when he says it's better to marry than to burn, false prophet, he's not talking about burning with lust. Because the truth of the matter is, no matter how in love you are with your spouse, you still lust for their body. That's, but that's God's way. God put that desire. We're not animals. Now it is said that animals just procreate and they mate with one another just instinctively. It has nothing to do with, with desire. But God didn't put that in humans. We're not just, you know, just tripping over one another, sleeping with one another just for the purpose of having babies. There is a desire there that God placed there. You see? But he wants that desire to be, that passion and that burning to be for our spouse. For somebody who he's designated for us. You see? And so here, when he says it is better to marry than he tend to burn, he's talking about burning in hell. Why? Because when you don't have self-control and you're sleeping around, that's where you're going. Ain't no sugarcoating about it. That's, it's better for you to marry that woman or that man that you're being with, that, you, that you're designed to be with sexually. It's better for you to marry them than to burn in hell. Amen. You see, and so God, God wants us to to exercise discretion when we, uh, when we when we're married. He wants us to follow His word. We'll avoid so many problems if we'll learn to put, um, not try to bring our arguments into our bedrooms, and, and let that you know, and and allow our moods to dictate how we are in that area. God wants us to to have a passion and desire for one another. You know, God wants us to exercise uh, the authority that He has given us in this earth over our bodies. Bring that body under subjection, and the way you do that is through the Word of God. You direct it the way the Word of God says to direct it. And, and when you can't contain yourself and hold yourself, if you're not married, then it's better that you get married. And since we've said that, then let me say this. God doesn't want you getting married just for the purpose of having sex. He, he wants you to be with somebody that you love. God didn't ordain marriage just for you to fulfill your lust. Amen. You see, your husband or your wife isn't just somebody for you to sleep with. They're somebody for you to love. And that is what we have to know. Sex is, 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 is something that God gives to married couple as a, as a, a um, benefit for being married. It is something that he gives to married couples to enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, years and years ago, maybe at the turn of the century, uh, the, you know, that the, the uh, 20th century, uh, sex wasn't discussed much in the church. Women were taught you're not supposed to enjoy it because if you enjoy it, you're dirty or whatever the case is. God gave you that desire for a reason. And even even in in tribes, some tribes in Africa, 
they circumcise the women to keep them from being able to enjoy their husbands. And that's not God's will, you see. That's not God's will. He gave us uh, our members, the members of our bodies, to enjoy our spouse. But we have to make sure that we're lining up with the word of God and use it properly. Sex was designed to be a beautiful thing between husband and wife, but the devil have come along and perverted it. You notice here Paul, when he's referring to married people, he's talking about man and wife. Mm -hmm. Not man and man, not woman and woman, but man and wife. It doesn't matter what your president say. And folks today are saying, well, president, he ain't, he's not the Lord, but if you're electing him, you ought to at least hold him to the standard of the word. You see? That, there's no excuse for that. And, and you got so many silly Christians out there today to say, well, I don't care if the president believes, you know, it's okay for you. You better care. Amen. Because he'll, if he allow that junk to go on, what other kind of immoral junk? If, if he don't have enough sense and, and calling himself a Christian, if he doesn't have enough sense to know that marriage is supposed to be between a husband and a wife, that means he's not following God. And where is he leading this nation if he's not following God? You say, well, I believe politics should be, you know what? The, 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 that's a trick of the devil. This word of God is supposed to bypass any laws, all mm -hmm. politics, politicians, no matter what color they are, the word of God should be held up higher than anything else in this world. Amen. You know, that's my president. I, yeah, it sure is. But, you know, one prophet said it and I said, again, you've elected exactly what's in your heart, America. The, the laws that we have today with, with these gay marriages and things like that, that is what's in your heart. That's what happens when you turn your back on God. And so you say, well, I don't see anything wrong with homosexuality. I don't see anything wrong with gay marriages. You know, just let them get married and, 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 and stuff like that. Let me tell you what happened. They're going to want to have children. A lot of them are going to want to adopt or, or still use a man or a woman to carry their child, whatever the case is. And then they raise these children being messed up. Why? Because these children are confused. Seeing man and man sleeping in the same bed or two women sleeping in the same bed or being raised in a household like that. And let me tell you how this affects this whole nation. With that spirit of homosexuality, of course, that comes also with the spirit of perversion. That one and the same. The same spirit that burns inside of a man to lust after another man will hold the door open for a spirit to cause that same man to burn with lust towards children. Mm -hmm. See, the devil don't just stop there. And so what have happened is the devil have, have crept in and he's caused sex to become a, a dirty word, something that we don't talk about, you know, something that we don't discuss with our children. It is pure in God's eyes Amen. if it remains Amen. in the office that it's supposed to be Amen. in. That's right. Now, where everything go haywire is when we do it outside of God's will. Mm -hmm. When we're giving our bodies up before we're married, that's when it's haywire. Mm -hmm. You see? So let's line up with the word of God and let's allow the word to, to bring our bodies under, under submission. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the word that we've heard tonight. We pray, God, that something was said to help your people. God, we pray that you will help us to abide by your word, that you will help us to grow in your word, Lord. We lift up those who are in sexual immorality, those who are walking in darkness concerning this subject, Lord. We pray that you will help them and call them out of darkness, Lord. Give them a heart after you. Because we know that all of these things, every sin that we can name that people are doing is a result of them not having a relationship with you. And so, God, we pray that you would draw them by your spirit. Allow them to experience the love that you have for them, Lord. And, and Lord, we pray that you will convert their hearts and their minds, renew their minds to serve you, Lord. God, we pray that as people begin to live for you, Lord, that you will place them on the ministers that will help them to grow in your word. Place them on the shepherds, Lord, that will...
care for their souls, that will have a desire to see them to grow, Lord, in you and in your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the hearts that have received this message, and we pray that your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish what it was sent out to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.